Good morning, everyone. I uh, just want to thank Alyssa Eppel for that really amazing introduction. Um, I just want to say something else about UCSF before I talk about Alyssa, which is that UCSF is a really um, special place because it allows people to develop collaborations that normally we wouldn't have otherwise done. So uh, just by way of background, I used to work at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency before I came to UCSF, and when I got to UCSF, I thought, hmm, this is a little odd because I work on environmental health, and there's a lot of doctors around here and other researchers who work on medical sciences, and I wasn't, I mean, of course I knew what I did was really important, but I wasn't completely sure how other people on campus would react, and I, uh, and has been very encouraging and pleasing and just amazing that UCSF has taken on this issue. Uh, we started with Diana Laird, the Environmental Health Initiative. We've got a lot of support both from our Department of OBGYN and other members on campus. And Alyssa, who did the work on the Environmental Health Initiative, it was her idea to come up with this Exposome and Metabolic Health Conference. And uh, because she sees, along with other people on campus, the importance of understanding the Exposome in environmental influences on disease because, as Dan Lowenstein mentioned, genetics won't be the only solution to our challenges, our health challenges. And we have a health challenge that we are talking about today. So my goal is to thread the needle to give you the information so you understand the scope of the problem without being, as Alyssa said, shut off and not open to thinking about the solutions. So first, I'm going to give you some scary messages, but then I'm going to talk about some positive actions that have happened with your help. So, um, as you know, we have an obesity challenge in the United States. Uh, there's, this is a public health, really it's a public health crisis, and now we're seeing, um, because of this, along with other types of chronic health diseases, a, a change in the curve around actually even life expectancy particularly for certain populations in the United States. So it's something that we urgently need to address. And while we uh, recognize the increasing trend in obesity over time, I think that it's important to point out that there's other metabolic diseases that are going up. Uh, this is a particularly striking um, statistic on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease increasing in kids. This is a disease that should not be happening, well, first of all, we don't really want it to happen, but it should really be happening way farther down the life course than, than in children. So we have a challenge that we need to address. And one of the challenges that we have is that this short time frame in which we're seeing these increases in obesity and metabolic diseases are happening in such a short time frame that we can't just look to genetics as the solution to this problem. So I'm going to talk about industrial chemical exposures. Um, industrial chemical exposures have also increased, or the manufacturing and production of industrial chemicals have increased greatly since uh, starting in the 1950s, over 15-fold. And this is, um, we now have industrial chemicals produced for so many different aspects of our lives, including plastics, so plastic bottles, plastic uh, water containers, plastic applications. I'll talk a little bit more about plasticizers um, in an example in this talk. Uh, flame retardant chemicals, uh, chemicals that are used in our uh, in various aspects of our life, like nonstick pans, as well as other types of materials like PFAS. And so these many different types of industrial chemicals have been growing in their manufacturing and use. So this is a this is one of those depressing parts of the talk, which is there are a lot of industrial chemicals that are produced in the United States, but I think it's very eye-opening. So this is data from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. They record how much is being produced or manufactured every year. And um, in 2016, uh, and, uh, which was the same as in 2012 on this uh, chart, which is there's 9.5 trillion pounds of chemicals produced in the United States or imported, and that's 30,000 pounds per person. So I haven't really thought about how many cats or an allergy or something like that it is, but that's a lot of pounds, and so it's inevitable that those chemicals are getting out and getting into us. And so we're exposed to chemicals in so many different ways. You'll hear about air pollution exposure today. Um, you'll hear about contaminants in food. There's also contaminants in 
uh, drinking water. In the afternoon, we'll talk about some of the different types of products that we can get exposed to chemicals in, such as personal care products, cleaning, um, and various types of chemicals that are used in our home. I just want to also emphasize that some people have higher exposures than others, so we'll have a talk about that. For example, people who work in occupational settings can have higher exposures. Uh, in California, think of farm workers who work in the Central Valley and are working around both a lot of air pollution but also pesticide exposures. So we are going to talk today about many things that influence your health. So there's food, nutrition, your social and built environment, your life experiences. We, I, on our program on reproductive health and the environment, the Environmental Health Initiative, we're focusing on industrial chemicals. Uh, for uh, two reasons. One is we feel that they're undervalued in the research process, meaning that we actually don't know that much about the extent to which we're exposed to these chemicals and how they can influence our health. So it represents an opportunity for us to expand our knowledge and get better information about some of the risk factors that can be leading to these uh, growing disease trends. And the second is, is that because once we identify these chemicals, we can intervene, and this is the good news part I'm going to talk about in a minute, we can intervene, prevent them, lower the burden of the chemical exposures, and improve health. So I want to acknowledge the exposome. Um, uh, Dr. Martin Smith was an uh, author on this paper that was in science talking about the totality of different factors that uh, contribute to our exposome. So chemical exposures is one aspect. We're going to be talking about stress, but there's uh, food and diets, and these things, as I have mentioned, can interact together. But we know from studies that we have done, both at UCSF as well as other people across the United States, that we're all exposed to different and many industrial chemicals. This is from a study that we did. It's a little bit old now, but still true, um, that we looked at um, the data that's collected, it's, a, it's a, a survey that's done of the U.S. population. It's a representative survey. They had some uh, oversampling of pregnant women for a number of cycles. And what we found was that uh, pregnant women in the United States were exposed to 99% uh, to 100% of these pregnant women in the United States were exposed to about 43 different industrial chemicals. That means we're having a baseline of exposure among pregnancy. And there's a lot of reasons why we think this is an underestimate. Uh, many of these chemicals also, we know, are associated with adverse health outcomes. So one of the challenges is that we are, uh, we are uh, looking around or have ability to measure about 350 chemicals, but there's really about 8,000 maybe plus chemicals that are what we consider in high use in the United States. So there's a lot of challenges in terms of understanding exposures. Uh, people will talk about this briefly today, but some of the um, things that have emerged in the science over the last uh, decade or so is the role that chemicals can have in influencing uh, hormonal balance in the body. And this has been an important factor that we're looking at in terms of uh, risk related to some of these uh, adverse health outcomes. And that the timing of this exposure is very important because exposures that occur during the developmental period have the opportunity to reprogram the development such that can contribute to these child and later uh, adult health outcomes. So I am putting this quote in. This is not my quote. This is from the National Cancer Institute report. So this is a government body that focuses on cancer, but they have looked at the data on prenatal exposures in babies, and they say to a disturbing extent, babies are born pre-polluted because these chemicals don't stop at the placenta they go into the fetus. Um, so one of the challenges we have is how our policy is set up because the structural ways in which we uh, are managing these many chemical exposures. So pharmaceuticals have a lot of rigorous testing that's required before you can put them on the marketplace for safety and efficacy. Industrial chemicals do not have that type of testing. So one chemical that we I want to tell you about is uh, a phthalate. We're hearing a little bit more about it. It can influence testosterone levels and cause them to go down, which can lead to adverse male reproductive health effects. They're found, they're plasticizers, so they're found in many different uses, including home, plastics, cars, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics. Um, and uh, other types of applications. And we're all exposed to these phthalates, 
and they have been not only linked to male reproductive health effects, but also uh, because they can interfere with hormone levels, obesity, reduced fertility, and neurodevelopmental problems. But the good news is, is because of the scientific information about exposures and health effects, there have been campaigns by groups, and you'll hear about that this afternoon, to focus on getting them out of some of these sources. So this was from a campaign to remove them from cosmetics because they were found that they were actually uh, ubiquitous in uh, certain types of cosmetics like shampoos, lotions, et cetera. And this was followed by a law to ban phthalates um, that was passed both in California and in the United States, and it was signed by President Bush. And so the good news is phthalate levels went down. Both um, the two types of phthalates that were banned, we saw a reduction in them, as well as the phthalates that were part of the market-based campaigns. Unfortunately, the ones that were a substitute went up. So the good news is we can do it. The bad news is we something need a little more systemic approaches to dealing with this problem. We'll also note that sometimes these are not, risks are not distributed equally, and a lot of some of their certain types of products that are marketed or are used by um, women of color that uh, and can result in measurably higher levels of phthalates, and we'll hear more about that. Uh, we have a brochures for people who, because people want to have personal agency, and there are ways that you can reduce your exposures to these chemicals that have been shown to work. But we also want to make sure that we're focused on more systemic changes. This is a quote from um, Dr. Jeannie Connery, who's the president of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, our clinical partner in focusing on environmental reproductive health, saying we must shift the burden of proof from where it is now on us to the manufacturers before any chemicals are released into the environment, and that is our goal. So in conclusion, these exposures are ubiquitous, but we have shown that we can do something about them if we focus on them. It's a partnership with science and our um, other stakeholders, and you'll be hearing about that this afternoon. And so it's very important for us to continue to focus on these types of policy systemic changes to reduce our exposures to uh, harmful chemicals. And with that, I'd like to thank the organizers, which I guess includes myself, and, uh, <laughs> and also the staff at the program on Reproductive Health and the Environment and the Environmental Health Initiative. Thanks.